Coming up on Air Force Space Today, the commander of the nation's top ICBM wing speaks out on North Korea. The GPS program advances with one of the most highly evolved satellites yet. We'll hear from the commander of U.S. Strategic Command, General James Cartwright. And we'll introduce you to a Space Command NCO named to the 12 Outstanding Airmen of the Year on Air Force Space Today with your host, Krista Knauss. Hi, thanks for joining us. North Korea faces tough sanctions and worldwide condemnation after conducting an underground nuclear test. U.S. officials confirmed the test after analysis of air samples detected radioactive debris confirming a nuclear explosion. This post-Cold War event stands as a reminder that we are still living in a nuclear world. The 526th Intercontinental Ballistic Missile Wing at Hill Air Force Base, Utah, stands ready as a strategic deterrent should any nation ever consider targeting the U.S. with nuclear weapons. What I think the North Korean underground test has really done has raised everybody's awareness. I think a lot of people may have forgotten that this is a nuclear world and that there are nuclear threats to the United States. Uh, and in many ways, what this is going to do is just reemphasize that what we do in the 526 in partnership with the 20th is provide strategic deterrence against those threats. The ICBM Systems Wing is responsible for cradle-to-grave integrated management of the Minuteman and Peacekeeper weapon systems. The wing develops, acquires, and supports silo-based ICBMs and provides program direction and logistic support. All weapons system management is handled at one location with test facilities at Hill and the surrounding area. Strategic deterrence starts right here in Utah, right here at Hill. The 526 is responsible for developing, acquiring, fielding, sustaining, and then disposing of our nation's land-based ICBM force. Uh, we're providing a weapon system that has a greater than 99% operational availability. That's something that the President can count on. The United States currently has approximately 500 ICBMs on strategic alert. The Minuteman III Intercontinental Ballistic Missile is considered to be the world's premier ICBM weapons system. Raytheon Space and Airborne Systems is developing a sensor to capture images of Earth from a missile warning satellite under a $54.4 billion contract from the Air Force Research Laboratory. Under the alternate infrared satellite system program, Raytheon will design and build a developmental integrated sensor assembly for the Space and Missile Systems Center at Los Angeles Air Force Base. The satellite payload will look for infrared plumes and provide early warning of ballistic missile launches. Raytheon is one of two companies competing to build the final sensor model. The Air Force will make a selection in 2008. The Air Force launches and deploys the Global Positioning System 2R-15M satellite, one of the most technologically advanced GPS satellites. This latest addition to the GPS constellation is the second modernized M-version spacecraft to be launched and deployed. This new and improved satellite will provide GPS users several enhanced features, including a modernized antenna panel that provides magnified signal power to ground receivers, as well as two new military signals for increased accuracy, enhanced encryption, and anti-jamming capabilities. A second civil signal will provide civilian users an open access signal on a different frequency. GPS has really proven to be a key enabler of transforming how we do warfare. Uh, we've gone from the World War II days of uh, looking at how many sorties and how many bombs do we have to drop to take out a target, uh, to today we're really focused on precision warfare where we can have a single precision weapon take out a military target and minimize the collateral damage. Uh, GPS has been front and center in making that a reality. We first started going down that path as we started the population of the GPS constellation back in the early 1990s in the first Gulf War. Yeah, but it wasn't until the late 90s when we started to really understand the benefit and, uh, and some of the realities of transforming how we do precision warfare. The Air Force's Delta II rocket, which has been instrumental in sustaining the GPS constellation, comes through once again in the successful launch and deployment of the latest GPS satellite. The Delta team has launched all of the GPS-2 satellites to date, 
and Boeing looks forward to a continuing role in launching the replenishment satellites to keep the constellation operable seven days a week, 24 hours a day. You know, we're very proud of our role in maintaining the GPS constellation for the U.S. Air Force. And I think the major reason for that is the vital role that GPS plays to national security and defense. While controllers of the latest GPS satellite spend the following weeks guiding it into the GPS constellation 11,000 miles above Earth and testing its onboard systems, members of the 45th Space Wing look forward to the challenge of bringing this next generation of GPS satellites into full operation as part of the Space and Missile Systems Center's mission. Under Secretary of the Air Force, Dr. Ronald Sega sees space-based platforms continuing to be a vital asset to the nation's military forces. He is looking to get back to basics on space acquisition. I think we don't build that many satellites, particularly when you compare it to the number of airplanes we build or Humvees or something. So it's important for us to look across the enterprise and see if we can take advantage of uh, common parts, practices, standards, and so forth that cut across the space enterprise to make us more efficient in the way we design, build, and then uh, operate our satellites. The goal is to reduce the acquisition cycle time and to procure operational systems with more mature technologies. The physicist who co-founded aerospace giant TRW Incorporated has died. Dean Everett Woldridge was 93. Woldridge helped develop the nation's intercontinental ballistic missile program. He was best known for partnering with Simon Ramo to create TRW, which revolutionized missile technology and helped hasten America's high-tech weapons development early in the Cold War. Stay tuned as Air Force Space Today continues. In our last edition, we unveiled the nation's first wideband gap filler satellite, one of three which make up Block 1. The Air Force and the Boeing Company have concluded negotiations on a contract for three additional satellites called Block 2. One wideband gap filler satellite provides the military with more data throughput than the entire Discus constellation currently on orbit. The three latest versions will see an initial contract award later this year. Since 9-11, the scale and pace of what's around us is fundamentally different, according to commander of U.S. Strategic Command, General James Cartwright. We are a nation at war, and, and we should not forget that. It is an imperative that is demanding that we think about the way we do business and think about doing business in a very different way. Transformation is really an acknowledgement of the fact that we cannot keep doing what we've been doing. Transformation is not incremental improvement. Transformation is an acknowledgement fundamentally that what it is we're providing isn't the right thing. And, and that's hard to accept. But when you step across the line of departure, take the end of the runway, push the button to launch, everything changes. And if you're not ready to adapt faster than the adversary, then you're going to be outmaneuvered. And it's just a fact. And if we're not ready to do some serious transformation, then we have to wait for 9-11, and, and it is not a pretty picture. General Cartwright says each and every one, regardless of service and rank, plays a vital role in the war on terror. As we honor our nation's veterans this month, it's also a time to recognize the outstanding airmen serving today, carrying on their legacy. The top 12 Outstanding Airmen of the Year for 2006 represent over 400,000 enlisted members of the Air Force, Active Guard, and Reserve Forces. The selectees were each recognized at the Air Force Association Air and Space Conference and Technology Exposition in Washington, D.C. Air Force Space Command salutes one of its own, Senior Master Sergeant Michael Lemke from F.E. Warren Air Force Base, Wyoming, as one of the 12. 
Currently, Sergeant Lemke is the 90th Contracting Squadron Superintendent at F.E. Warren. This year marks the 50th anniversary of the Outstanding Airman Award. Dedication, determination, loyalty, and valor, those are the characteristics that make our airmen great. They are the same ideals airmen have pursued since we took to the skies in 1909. At their core, all airmen share the same essence, the same driving force, the willingness to answer the call to service to something greater, and the willingness to lay down their lives to defend our nation and our way of life. To each of our outstanding airmen and to your families, let me say we're proud of you. You embody everything that we hold dear. You represent the highest ideals of our Air Force. General Jimmy Doolittle was a legendary figure, an air and space power pioneer. He led a daring raid over Tokyo in World War II, earning the Medal of Honor. He advanced aerospace technology, including helping develop equipment still in use today. Even after retirement, General Doolittle continued to serve his country as chairman of the Board of Space Technology Laboratories. Here at Los Angeles Air Force Base, the Doolittle legacy is alive and well. In fact, she reports to work here every day. He was an extremely decent man. He was an honorable man. I think the word integrity defines him and his love of this nation and his love of our military will, will outlive us all. I was asked what, you know, what do I think he would like to have seen happen with aviation that didn't. I think what he saw in his lifetime with aviation is more than anybody could ever even imagine or dream. I mean, he went from, from flying a Jenny back in World War I to watching them land on the moon. Jana works in the education and training flight at Los Angeles Air Force Base. Learning about American history from my grandfather, from General Doolittle, was particularly interesting because of the inside stories he would tell me about different events, the people that he worked with. Um, it was particularly fun learning about the raid and the men that he flew with on the raid. I think my grandfather had a major role in the Air Force becoming a separate service. From the very early days, right after World War I, he believed strongly that the Air Force, that air power would define our role in any kind of conflict. Superior air power does define our role in almost any conflict. My goal is to protect his memory. He was an extremely decent man. He was an honorable man. I think the word integrity defines him. And his love of this nation and his love of our military will, will outlive us all. Stay tuned as Air Force Space Today takes you out of this world. I'm in. Okay, Jason's helped me in the... Uh lower torso there. These are uh, just the astronaut's pants here. This device I've got underneath me is a liquid cooling and ventilation garment. It is to prevent the astronaut from sweating. Today hopefully it prevents me from sweating. And that's because we don't want a yucky, wet, sweaty astronaut. Yeah. Not a good thing ever to meet a yucky, wet, sweaty astronaut. If they are that way, I run from them. <laughs> if, uh, the, uh, the other reason is we don't want them to lose their body fluid because they would just have to replenish that body fluid during their spacewalk. They have a way to drink water, we'll talk about that in a minute, but you do not want them to lose that body fluid during their, during their mission. So, this keeps them cool by conduction instead of convection and evaporation as you are normally used to keeping cool. Okay. Now those little thumb loops on there, 
this is the little shimmy, shimmy, shimmy. That was a fun part. Those little thumb loops kept my uh, liquid cooling garment on while we dove up through the uh, suit there and actually worked out pretty well today. Sometimes only one of the three things comes out the top and you gotta work that again. The head and two hands. This is the Snoopy cap, if you can figure that one out. The Snoopy cap is uh, named uh, hopefully appropriately, except normally you'd see some ears flopping down here and a little yellow bird on my shoulder. <laughs> this is how the astronauts keep in, in touch with each other and back to the spacecraft. The, uh, the pants are going to connect to the upper torso here, and you know, hopefully this is always an important safety point. Uh, we want to make sure that this connection is is made, and uh, and there'll be a there's four major connections like this on the spacesuit. There's the connection at the pants, there's a connection in each glove, and then there's a connection at the helmet. And each one of those has a double lock on it, okay? Fundamental thing to remember this morning is that in spacesuits, and as I usually say, really throughout NASA, leaks bad. Don't want leaks. Leaks are in the bad category. And if you lost your pants in space, that's very bad. It's a big leak, a lot of air. Quickly, quickly your blood Wow, is that loud. Quickly, your uh, your blood is going to start to boil, and that's really not a fun thing. Talk softly. Anytime my, my blood starts boiling, I'm looking for something else to do pretty quickly. <laughs> so all those connections have got three motions that you have to do to, to break the connection, and those, those motions are all perpendicular to each other. The gloves are the same way. The helmet's the same way. The wrist and the comfort gloves go on to do a couple things. They'll keep my hands from sweating. Um, and because the fabric, see how soft this is right now and how much it moves around? And hopefully you can see some of this up on the screen if you can't, if you're not up towards the front. That'll be very difficult to move later. When the suit fills up, it becomes very stiff and that fabric can literally chafe your skin. So you would get a raw spot on your skin. So this prevents your skin from chafing. Plus the aluminum rings and the steel rings on the gloves here will, will do that too. Okay. We're going to put the gloves, gloves on next. Oh, see now we got them. We got them backwards. We got to fix that. We'll switch the gloves. It takes way too much paperwork at NASA to cut somebody's thumb off. So we we found that out. So we'll just switch the gloves because it seems to be an easier easier approach. Jason has verified airflow. We hope because I'd like to be able to breathe. I can talk much better when I'm breathing. <laughs> Funny how that works. Okay, and he's checking uh, all the connections, and what's going to happen now is that Jason's going to pressurize the spacesuit again. The red stripes on the lower torso there are to designate which crew member I'm in. I am. You got two astronauts out there in spacesuits like this. They're going to look pretty much the same. You know, like you take one picture of one, and you can just you got a picture of the second one already. It's funny. The only photograph of Neil Armstrong on the moon is there's a great picture on the moon from Apollo 11 with the person in a spacesuit. It's not Neil Armstrong. It's uh, it's Buzz Aldrin. Neil Armstrong had the camera, but the only picture of Neil Armstrong on the moon is the reflection of Neil Armstrong in Buzz Aldrin's helmet. Check gets done. The Air Force has always been known for taking care of its family. That includes making sure family childcare is available for swing and evening shifts, extended duty assignments, and for children with special needs or health conditions. It looks like a preschool, but it's Jeanette Pablo's living room. She is one of the base family child care providers at Vandenberg Air Force Base, California. One of about 25 licensed and certified people who provide care for children from 6 weeks to 12 years old in a home environment. The program gives small group care, even during unusual work hours, or for children with special needs. It also allows providers like Jeanette to benefit from staying at home with her own children. As a family child care provider, we have a great impact on the children. They do what we do. So what we teach them, how we talk, how we eat, how we act. We are around them for 10 hours a day and they, they learn from us. Vandenberg's 30th Services Squadron Family Child Care Program provides all the equipment and supplies through the Lending Library. 
Nearly everything a person needs to be a daycare provider is there, from play mats to playhouses, from books to buggies. Besides equipment, providers receive training to meet base requirements before offering care to children. The training makes the transition easy for people who love children, want to be their own bosses, and be with their own children. In addition to the initial training, providers receive support, continuous training, and inspections. It's an awesome job to be a home daycare provider because it takes a lot for the parents to trust us and it's an honor for, to have them trust us with their children. Over the past 30 years, the Los Angeles Regional Food Bank has been committed to providing food to the hungry. But without volunteers, the food bank could not provide the level of service so many agencies depend on to feed those in need. Volunteers from Los Angeles Air Force Base are contributing to the cause. Today, we brought as many volunteers as we could from our wing to uh, support uh, local efforts here. We're trying to palletize and stack food and get it ready for distribution for our senior citizens in uh, Los Angeles. Oh, keep going. Everything is uh, going smoothly. We've been able to uh, palletize a lot of food here, get things, get things going. Uh, there's a lot of motivation with, with the group here. We've been able to uh, work with uh, the, the leadership here at, at the Los Angeles Regional Food Bank to uh, speed things up, get a lot of food palletized. Uh, last year we, we broke out and had about 29 tons, and this year we're trying to do a little bit more. When we see the speed of the volunteers here as we do today, it means that we're going to get a lot uh, more production done. Um, we have 7,000 kits to produce every month, so we don't really have a lot of lag time. So when uh, gentlemen like this come in and really put out the extra effort, it means a lot to us. It really gets a lot more done. Today we're really appreciative that the Air Force uh, has come in today to help. Um, these guys put their lives on the line all the time to protect our country, and now they're actually donating a lot of extra time to come here and help the community. Um, this is a big inspiration for a lot of our other groups that come in. Um, and what we like to do is when we tell uh, some of the other branches of the armed forces that the Air Force has come in, it kind of inspires them to come in, makes a nice competition um, to get these guys to come in and volunteer their time. These guys always do an outstanding job and they're always uh, doing above and beyond the call of duty by coming in here and, and helping us. And that'll do it for this edition. From all of us at Air Force Base today, thanks for joining us.